the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We join together in the call to worship this morning. We come with what strength we have in us to, to learn, learn to, to love, love God and self and, and one, one another. another. When we practice love, we discover that the love grows, adding, adding color and, and life, life to, to all, all we say and do. This is a gift of God for, for all, all creation. of creation. As we gather, we sing this morning hymn number 310, Bring Many Names. service of worship today. It's a joy for us to be together. Uh, welcome to those uh, streaming, uh, live streaming through our website. A special welcome to those listening in on CKWR 98.5 radio. And a warm welcome to those who are tuning in after the fact on our YouTube channel. Gosh, I miss seeing your faces. It's been a long time. <laughs> our, our gathering this morning is richer uh, because you are here. Our prayer has already begun. I'd like to pray using some words. Let's continue our prayer together. God of giving, you loved us by taking on the fullness of our humanity. You came to reconcile us to you and to one another. 
You came to show us the way, a way of life filled with meaning, compassion, and forgiveness. How easily we forget. Too quickly we draw lines in the sand, claiming we know who's in and who's out. We utter weak excuses in the face of injustice. We confess half-hearted love of neighbor. Yet you, O God, are rich in mercy. You forgive us even before we ask. And in a spirit of great grace, you invite us once again to join you on the path of faithful living. We are grateful for this gift. We offer these prayers, both spoken and unspoken, in the spirit of Jesus Christ, the one who taught the disciples to pray together, saying, I have good news for you today. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Something new has been born in us, is being born in us right now, and will be born in us. This is God's promise, and this is God's gift, and we give God thanks and praise. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. of the Lord be with you at home and in your heart. Shalom with you abide through the day and night, every day of your life. So I went for a walk the, uh, the other day down uh, King Street here in Uptown Waterloo. And uh, it was great to see people out and about. Um, most people were still out and about in a safe kind of way, which is good. We're not through this pandemic yet, uh, but it was nice to be able to go into some shops and to, uh, to greet, greet people. Uh, and one of the stores I love to pop into uh, here in Waterloo is Wordsworth Books. And it was wonderful to be able to browse in a real bookstore again. And the first place I always go to when I go into the bookstore is way at the back on the left-hand side. There's the picture book section. I like to read big people books too. I like lots of different kinds of books. But I love picture books. And uh, I think one of the things I like about picture books is picture books can sometimes take really big, important ideas and communicate them in a really brief and beautiful way. And there are some really good people, good authors, storytellers who can do that. And I'm so excited because I've, I've picked up this one picture book. It's called I Am Human, the book of empathy. It's, it's a book of empathy, but it's a book that's about more than that. Anyway, I'm so excited to read it to you today. I'm just so glad I found it. I bought a copy for my bookshelf because I know I will pick this book up. The, the artwork is beautiful. Um, but the storytelling is lovely. It's, it's about empathy, but it's also about the way we are called to keep growing in life. 
We're never, we're never done learning things in life. We never stop growing. Some of us think we've got the answers to things. Some of us big people like to think, okay, I've got my life figured out. I know what I believe, I know what I like to do, and I'm just going to stick with the routine. But really, that's not what life is all about. Life is a wonderful invitation for us just to explore the world, to keep learning new things. We're never too old to, to learn new things. Uh, and we can, we can develop new hobbies, we can grow in relationships. Our spirituality, our understanding of the Christian faith can grow and change as well. I think this is one of the things that Jesus taught us to, to think about all the time. Uh, and that is to, to, keep, to keep evolving, to keep growing. Uh, I love st the stories of Jesus where he taught people who, who thought that the world was about insiders and outsiders. He taught people to welcome in those who were on the outside of the community. And he made the community richer because of it. People had to learn that. Uh, people who had illnesses in their body and their mind, Jesus told them not to just accept it, but to keep living, to keep growing. And he, he brought them healing, and he brought them a new kind of peace. Jesus was always challenging people to keep learning about discipleship, what it is to follow in his footsteps. That's what this book is about. It's, it's about being human and the human journey of growth. So I'm going to read it for you today, and you'll see the pictures it's a book by Susan Verd, and the art, which people on the radio, I'm sorry, can't see, um, but uh, the art is by Peter H. Reynolds. I was born a miracle, one of billions, but unique. I am human. I am always learning. I'm finding my way and choosing my path on this incredible journey. I have big dreams. I see possibility. I have endless curiosity. I make discoveries. I have a feeling of wonder. I am amazed by nature. I have a playful side. I find joy in friendships. I am human. Being human means I am not perfect. I make mistakes. I can hurt others with my words, my actions, and even my silence. I can be hurt too. I can be fearful of things I don't yet understand and timid to try something new. I have a heavy heart when I feel sadness. I am human. But then I remind myself that because I am human, I can make choices. I can move forward A poor choice can become a better choice with thoughtfulness. A bad day can become a great day with kindness. I can act with compassion and lend a helping hand. I can treat others with equality and be fair. I can choose not to fight, but instead to listen and find common ground. I can say, I'm sorry, 
and ask for forgiveness. I am human, one of billions, but unique. I am not alone. I am connected to my friends, to my family, to the world. We are all humans together. And I will keep trying to be the best, the best version of me. I am full of hope. I am human. Thank you to Susan Verd and Peter Reynolds for your beautiful book. I think the song we sang last Sunday fits today too, a song about making something beautiful. I see this song as kind of a prayer, a prayer to God to help us live in such a way that, that we can make beautiful things. Let me make something beautiful A thing that reminds us there's good in the world A thing that reminds us there's still something out there worth fighting for Cause it feels like the whole world's going crazy Spinning faster and cheaper than ever before and it feels like there's nobody given a care that it's getting worse. Ooh, 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 let it be something wonderful. Ooh, 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 let it be something beautiful. Let's sing it again. Please let me make something beautiful A thing that reminds us there's good in the world A thing that reminds us there's still something out there we're fighting for Cause it feels like the whole world's going crazy Spinning faster and cheaper than ever before and it feels like there's nobody given a care that it's getting worse. Ooh, let it be something wonderful. Ooh, let it be something beautiful. Let me make something beautiful A thing that reminds us there's good in the world Amen, and peace be with you all And thank you, MC, for joining in That was lovely We turn now to readings from Scripture. There are two short readings this morning. The first one is from the Gospel of John, and the second is from Mark's Gospel. Let us listen for what the Holy Spirit might be trying to teach the church. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled, Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. 
Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And from Mark's Gospel. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will soon be able afterwards to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us, For truly, I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. These stories are the witness of the early church. Thanks be to God. Part of my job is to have conversations with people. And as I meet with people and converse about religious things, one of the topic which one of the topics which comes up on a regular basis is that of how the Christian faith is to be in relationship with other faiths in the world. We could call that religious pluralism. And Christians are all over the map about how they think the Christian faith should exist in relation to other faiths. On the one hand, many Christians seem to want a less hostile approach to other religions. They don't like the win-lose, it's either us or them mentality, which many of us have inherited. An approach which too easily can descend into prejudice, dehumanization, and even violence toward the other. And you know Christian history is stained with such sin. But many Christians are also uncomfortable with the approach where whatever you believe is fine as long as you're sincere, and they may suggest that too much of this thinking undermines commitment and identity among followers of Christ. Are there any other lenses through which we can view this topic? Well, Indeed, there are. The question of how we relate to people of other faiths is an important one as we attempt in this day and age to think about Christianity and our faith in new ways, what some people refer to as emergent Christian thinking. I believe we have to start thinking about our faith in new ways because we live in a radically different world than the one in which you and I were raised. And I don't think it does anyone, it doesn't do the church, it doesn't do you or me any good for Christians to hunker down in a defensive position, grasping with all our might onto the religious worldview which we inherited from our forebearers, a worldview designed for a very different world than ours. I don't think we need to be afraid to question the traditions which have been handed down to us. We don't need to be afraid to explore theology. We don't need to be afraid to study the Bible and our traditions creatively. Indeed, we can enjoy such activities. After all, it says somewhere in Bible that the love of God casts out all fear. We don't need to be afraid. So in a typical conversation with someone about this issue of other faiths and Christians' relationship with other faiths, what typically happens is that someone at some point in the conversation will quote John 14, 6, and they'll say to me something like this, but Jesus said he was the way and the truth and the life and that no one can get to God except through him. So this conversation can end now because that's what Jesus said. Now, this particular interpretation of the verse seems to suggest that it is the Christians who claim the ultimate truth when it comes to God. Because, according to John, Jesus said those words himself. Now, this view holds that Christians possess exclusive access to the mind and heart of God. 
It's as if this verse becomes kind of a litmus test for Christian faith, a rallying cry of Christian triumphalism, proof that Christians indeed do have the corner on God and that many people of other faiths, they are in error, they may even be condemned. So in response to such an approach, such an interpretation of this verse of Scripture, John 14, 6, I think a fair question to ask of it is, is that a fair and is that an accurate reading of this verse? Is it responsible interpretation for us to use this verse as a weapon with which to bludgeon opponents into theological submission? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's take a few minutes and look a little more closely at this passage in its original context, in its narrative context. Now, it's no accident that this text is often a favorite choice of preachers and mourners at funeral services. After all, the mood in this story is somber, it's heavy, it is a funeral mood. You see, the disciples have just entered a time of grief. Their hearts were distressed and pained. Why? Well, Jesus had just begun talking about his departure. He gathered them in an upper room together there in a quiet, intimate place where they could be alone to say their goodbyes. And while they were there, Jesus did a remarkable thing. And you know this story. He grabbed a basin and he washed the disciples' feet. It was an intimate and touching illustration of the kind of servanthood love Jesus had for them. But not just for them. This act embodied his entire life that he gave himself continually and unconditionally for all people in an attempt to heal people's broken lives. This foot-washing scene symbolized Jesus' entire ministry. Now, after drying their feet, Jesus, deeply troubled in spirit, began to speak about his, his impending death, that he would be denied, that he would be betrayed. The disciples were probably reeling in confusion and despair. How would they be able to go on without him? The poor disciples were so adolescent in their understanding of Jesus' message, vision, and mission. They were terrified to think that they'd be left on their own. They felt like children at home alone for the first time. How would the community of Jesus' followers, which the disciples had helped build up, how would they survive without the presence of Jesus himself? They were grieving. They were probably crying. And that is the moment when Jesus spoke some gentle and encouraging words to the disciples in an attempt to comfort them. He said, In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. Now when you and I hear that word, we automatically think heaven, we think afterlife. But it's really interesting to note that the only other time Jesus uses this phrase, Father's house, in John's gospel, it's not in a reference to heaven at all. Way back in chapter 2, when Jesus drives the money changers from the temple, he cries, stop making my Father's house a marketplace. Isn't that interesting? He's referring to the temple. Here in his farewell speech to the disciples, it could be that Jesus is not talking about heaven at all, but rather about the community of followers. There will be many rooms in the temple, many rooms for communities of grace. There will be so much space for you and others to be comforted and guided by the love of God as you carry on my healing work in this world. Many rooms in the temple, lots of space. It is then in this context, not in talk of afterlife, but in talk of here and now and ministry, that Jesus says to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And of course, for the disciples, that was 
That was totally true. It was Jesus who had showed them the way of discipleship. Jesus showed them the truth of significant revelation of God in him. Jesus showed them what it is to to have life living in the Spirit. But then Jesus comforts them even further. No one, he says, meaning you, the disciples, here with me now, You don't come to God. You won't know God unless you do it through me. In other words, I have shown you the kind of God you follow. Look at my life. Look at my deeds. Look at my character. When I'm gone, continue my work. I have shown you the way. I have shown you the path to follow. And that is the way to live in God. I think when John tells this story, he's using insider language. It's language of hope for frightened and anxious followers. These words of Jesus are intended to comfort, to strengthen, to reassure, and to bless the disciples who are feeling abandoned. But it's also the language of love, the way we speak about someone who is beloved to us. We say to our beloved, you are the most beautiful person in the world. And when we say that most of the time, we're not making an actual factual statement that everyone in the world should also agree with. This is language of love. The statement that the disciples get to be with God through Jesus is beloved language. It's language of the heart. It's not language of universal objective factuality. It's a language of delight. It's language of commitment. It's language of encouragement that they should keep serving, keep working, keep the ministry of Jesus alive, keep being a blessing in this world which Jesus served. Jesus, you are for us. We are the church and you are the only one for us. Maybe this spirit, the nuances of this spirit, are at the heart of what it is when the disciples say that Jesus is the only way. Maybe it's not intended to be the language of universal factuality. Maybe it's language of deep love and deep commitment and deep relationship. Jesus, you are the only one for me. Jesus, your way is the only way for us. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that thinking about this passage in the context of the narrative itself, it helps me to hear it differently. Is Jesus making here a universal and sweeping claim about the only way that every person in the universe can experience God? Is this passage intended to be a holy pill which you have to swallow if you want to encounter God in your life? Is the intention of Jesus here in his funeral message to the disciples to draw a line in the sand and have a discussion about who's in and who's out and cut off millions, billions of people in all times and places who don't call themselves Christian? Is this the intent of this passage of Jesus having a funeral meal with his disciples in a place of intimacy and love and commitment? I don't think so. (laughs) I think it would be a rather odd way to understand the tone and meaning of this verse. I might even call it a terribly inappropriate way to understand this verse. I would say that it could be a gross misrepresentation to take such sacred words of comfort and twist them into words of exclusion and judgment. Jesus knew nothing about present-day global issues related to the Christian's connection with world religions. And so I don't believe it's appropriate to make the claim that this verse speaks to questions that were never in John's or Jesus' purview. I would suggest that the common interpretation of this verse actually distorts the theological heart of this touching story To use this verse in a battle over the relative merits of world religions, no, I don't think so. 
Jesus is the way is a joyous affirmation of a religious community that does indeed believe that God is available to them decisively in incarnation. Jesus is the way can be our joyous affirmation. It's my joyous affirmation. But does that mean necessarily that it's not possible for others who are outside the church to also show us what it means to live in way and in truth and in life? Could not God be bigger and more mysterious than the box that we often are guilty of trying to shove God into? Like the box of our religious language or the box of our preferred metaphors? Can one know about way, truth, and life apart from Jesus? For me, the answer is yes. The enduring religions of the world all include lovers of the mystery, lovers of God, in whom we can see way and truth and life, the way of discipleship and learning and wisdom, the truth of significant revelation of God, and the life of living in the Spirit, living in compassion and love, not just Christians, but others who know and follow this sacred way. I simply cannot reconcile the Jesus of mercy and peace, who taught us what it means to follow God's way, God's truth, and God's life, with a God who would condemn most of the world for not being followers. I just can't reconcile that. How did Jesus live his life? He washed the feet of the disciples. Jesus' way was compassion, acceptance, forgiveness, inclusion, and love from beginning to end. I expect to see these loving qualities in the lives of people who claim to follow Jesus, but I can also see these loving activities in the lives of people from a variety of spiritual and religious traditions I see these qualities at work in people who have no connection with religion or community of faith. Does that mean that these life-giving activities of such non-Christian folk are, are meaningless because they're not done in the name of Jesus? I, I don't buy that. Of course they're meaningful. Jesus spent his life tearing down walls seeking connection and relationship in all ways. I guess what I'm saying is this. I reject the notion that the inclusive pre-resurrection Jesus would suddenly become the exclusive post-resurrection Jesus. That's so important, I'm going to say it again just so we have time to let it sink in. I reject the notion that the inclusive pre-resurrection Jesus would suddenly become the exclusive post-resurrection Jesus. Now, sometimes in my conversations with people on this topic, the first re response I, I hear is often, well, what's the use then? If there's nothing unique about Christianity, then anything goes, doesn't it? It's all meaningless. Well, hardly. Christianity has lots of unique gifts to give the world, and life-changing transformation relationship with God through the Christian faith is, n is not meaningless. It is life-giving and meaningful. I love the story of the young couple who were dabbling in all kinds of different religious traditions, trying to choose the one which was best for them. They wanted to experience the value of each religious tradition. And then they met a very wise and insightful person who said, you know what, it's great you're you know, dabbling in all these, these religious uh, activities, but if you want to get water, you got to dig a well in one place. Jesus is my well. My understanding of God is revealed 
in the life of Jesus. He's the one that I choose to follow. As the old Bob Dylan song says, everybody's got to serve somebody. Everybody does serve somebody. Everybody follows somebody. Everybody follows something in life. I follow Jesus. Well, I try to, anyway. That doesn't mean that he's the only one who can teach me about finding way and truth and life. Other religions teach pathways to the sacred, to the mystery. Other religions dig their own wells to access the water which is underneath all of, all of us, the same water source. And as faithful followers of other, rather faithful followers of other religions practice what they would consider to be holy acts too, you know, things like washing feet, loving one another. Christianity does offer the world tremendous gifts. Christianity is unique in that it offers the gift of a theology which has been revealed personally in humility and servanthood and sacrifice. The theology of resurrection, and by that I don't mean afterlife, I mean finding new life, finding new living resurrection in the here and in the now, that's distinctive in our tradition. That's a tremendous, beautiful gift that the Christian faith gives to the world. And it inspires us and it transforms us. There are many unique qualities of the Christian faith. But is it imperative that every person in the world find transformation the same way I do? I think God celebrates transformation for the good wherever, however, whenever, and through whomever it can happen. A little bit of a longer sermon today, I know, and I just scratched the surface. <laughs> it's a huge topic. How Christians are called to live in such a complicated world, a multi-faith world. We can be committed Christians, and we can seek a new kind of Christianity. Now, I have to say that I don't have everything figured out. I don't I'm not telling you what to think. My job is just to muse, to ponder. To th I'm on a journey, like the, books, the book talked about earlier. I am human. I'm on a journey. I'm growing. And part of what I do is I share with you insights into my journey. I don't have everything figured out. Far from it. I don't have the answers to anything. Far from it. I'm on a journey, and I share with you glimpses of the ways I am a work in progress. But I am committed to my belief that there is a way, that there are ways for us to be faithful followers of Christ which do not require us to be flatly and implacably against other religions and their adherents. We're all, well, most of us anyway, trying to make the world a better place. Surely that connects us. Surely that unites us. There is hope for the world. If I did not believe that, I would not be here today. There is hope for the world as we imitate the servanthood love of Jesus Christ. As we learn slowly that the most important thing we are called to do in the world is not point a finger, but rather to wash feet.
thank you. Thank you, Alicia and Sophie, for, uh, for that beautiful piece. Thank you to the Chancel Choir for leading parts of our service today. And there's another piece coming up in just a few moments. You get to hear them again. Thank you to MC. Thank you to our awesome tech team today, to Eric, to Barb, to Maeve, and to Kathleen. Thank you for your faithfulness. You help transform lives of individuals in this community. Thank you for that gift. Just a couple of brief announcements. Uh, both uh, Hugh and Courtney are going to be on vacation for the next uh, few weeks during August. In the event of a pastoral emergency between August 8th and 26th, you can contact the Reverend Janice Hamalainen if you need her contact information. It was circulated in the This Week at Knox, which went out on Friday, or you can also just contact the office at Knox if you'd like to connect with her. And the next three Sundays, the services will be led by three of the ministers in association with Knox, uh, Janice Hamalainen, Andrew Song, and Mark Gedke. So grateful for their participation. A bit of good news. In, uh, in the spring of this year, Knox held an elder election. Voting forms were circulated to all professing members of Knox Waterloo. Submitted names were gathered, and a committee of session met to discern the will of the congregation, who you would like to see help lead the church over the next years. And so the session of Knox Waterloo is pleased to announce that the eight people called to serve another term on session are these following individuals. Lori Carter, Kathleen Ford, Sean Jackson, Kathy Sauve, Deb Schlichter, Sue Senior, Greg Senema, and Jen Yesis. A service of ordination and uh, recognition will be planned for a worship service in September. We're so pleased that these individuals have heard the call of the congregation and the call of God to serve as leaders in Knox Waterloo. We have amazing leadership at Knox Waterloo. We are so blessed, so blessed. Thank you for the gifts that you have given to support the ministries of Knox Church to further Christ's ministries. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's take a few moments now and uh, as we hear and enjoy a gift from the choir, ponder the ways that we give gifts to God.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures high and low. Praise God in Jesus' holy known. Creator, word and speech. As we pray together today, I would like to invite you to include a couple of items in your prayers. Uh, one is that uh, we were very sad that Knox to hear that Su Hui Lin, mother of Ruth Song, died this past Wednesday. A service uh, for family will be held here in the Knox Sanctuary on Saturday, August 14th, next Saturday, at 10 a.m., and that will be live streamed for you to tune in if you wish. More information can be found at the Urban Good website. Please remember to carry Ruth and her family in your prayers and in your hearts. And also, I invite you to remember and to name a young lad named Ramsey. He's closely connected with some folks here at Knox. Ramsey is awaiting a match for a bone marrow donor. Please remember him. We continue our prayer together. O oh God, deliver us from assuming that your mercy is always gentle. Pressure us that we may grow more human. Deepen Deepen us, O oh God, our joys and our hurts until we learn to share them and ourselves openly and share our needs honestly. Sharpen our fears until we name them and release the power we have locked in them and they in us. Accentuate our confusion, O oh God, until we shed those grandiose understandings and expectations that divert us from real love and discipleship, life in the here and the now. Help us to see where we are hurt, O oh God, crouched in fear, until we are able at last to laugh through our common frailties and failures Laugh our way towards becoming whole. Deliver us, O oh God, from just going through the motions, wasting everything we have, which is today a chance, a choice, our creativity, your call. O oh, persistent God, let how much it all matters pry us off dead center so if we are moved inside to tears or sighs or screams or smiles or dreams they will be real they will be in touch with who we are and who you are and who our siblings are We offer these prayers, both spoken and unspoken, in the spirit of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And together we say, Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number, hmm, number 762, for those of you who have hymnals at home. When the Poor One, 762. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da
brothers, siblings. May the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you along the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your hearts to love. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you.